Hello everyone, I'm L. Ron Lawrence. I'm the Communications Director for the Diocese of El Camino Real. And we're here with the Reverend Su Ying Wang, the Rector of St. Thomas Sunnyvale. And we're here to learn about her story and her family and have a conversation. So hello, Su Ying, how are you today? I'm well, thank you, Al Ron, for having me. Hey, thank you for being here. Um, so tell us a little about yourself, uh, how long you've lived in Sunnyvale, where else you've lived. Tell us briefly about your life and career and your family. Uh, uh, thank you. I've been at St. Thomas now for almost five years and uh, I've been in California. I've returned to California from Colorado uh, about now 15 years and I was ordained in Colorado and got my MDiv in Colorado. I actually was in Colorado getting my um, uh, doctorate in uh, chemistry, but uh, decided to go in the path of uh, sem the seminary and ordained ministry from there. So, so that's, uh, that's a really quick thing, but I, came, I went from California to Colorado. Um, my family immigrated to Col uh, California, so I've been here most of my life. Oh, and where did your family uh, immigrate from? We immigrated from China when I was uh, turning eight, so that was in 1980. The story of how we immigrated is rather interesting, uh, and I learned this story only uh, two years ago, uh, I thought that we were the first generation to come to the United States um, of my family. But in fact, uh, my great grandfather had come to the United States in the early 1900s. And uh, this I learned only two years ago because I saw a pail, uh, a, a very rusty pail in my sister's house and I wondered why it was there. And my father said, oh, when we took our last trip to China, uh, your sister brought it back. It's the pail that your great grandfather had used when he came to the United States and worked and, and uh, went back to China and uh, brought that pail with him. And so now it's here. Wow. So the story around that is uh, interesting in that um, so I asked my dad, how come you never told us about this? And like, you, you know, and, and my father's like, you don't talk about these things. Uh, you learn to hide all these stories because uh, of the cultural revolution. You don't want to be associated with uh, uh, foreignness, nor, um, you know, m when my great grandfather got the money, he went back to China, he bought land and then we, uh, my family became landed, which is a certain class in, um, in China. Uh, and uh, when the communists confiscated it all, everyone had to suppress these stories of, uh, of you know, being wealthier because you could be easily tagged as an anti-revolutionary and um, be in trouble. So I never even knew this story about my grandfather coming to the United States until two years ago. And I thought I had always been a part of the peasantry. It's that, you know, and my dad grew, you know, everyone had been rice farmers and all that. So, so it's interesting in that uh, because my great grandfather came here Oh, and by the way, I asked my dad, oh, did he work on the railroads? And my dad said, oh, no, that work was too hard. <laughs> I worked in the... <laughs> so I guess it's really hard work to work on the railroad. Uh, it gave me perspective because my uh, dad is a very, very hard worker. Uh, so my uh, great grandfather actually worked in a restaurant and uh, went back and and then bought land and accumulated land and became um, quite wealthy by Chinese standards there then. Mm -hmm. And so when we actually f came to the United States, um, it was the inheritance from that time that was sequestered in Hong Kong that uh, paid for our trip to the United States. Otherwise, we would have been indebted for a long time. Uh, 
So I, so how long have I, you know, I've been in California or my family, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's not a continuous story, but uh, my time, my family's been here since the early 1900s. So, so I'm curious, how do you relate to the terms immigrant or Chinese American? Yeah, so being an immigrant and being a Chinese immigrant is an interesting thing to be in America. Uh, especially as young as I was, I could have, if I had been white or maybe another race, could have assimilated uh, in a way that no one would ask me where I came from. Uh, but when you're Chinese or Asian American, the assumption is that uh, you're first generation and that you're foreign and you're not here from around here, right? So, so and also to be an immigrant for me is to feel a little uh, homeless. Uh, I grew up for eight years in uh, China. So, um, you know, uh, to be a part of that land, uh, that, you know, growing up there, and then to come here and to be treated very much as foreign, uh, very much as um, uh, when we first came here, I felt very unwelcome. And, uh, and I was um, mocked for my poverty and um, jeered at school. And, and I didn't, re I mean, you can tell you're being mocked even if you don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> so I didn't understand a word of English. I didn't speak any English. I came from a village that had no electricity or water or indoor plumbing. Uh, we were still fetching kindling to cook our meals. Uh, so to walk into this world was um, very discombobulating and then to be jeered at and mocked uh, for not speaking English and for being poor. Um, uh, that um, has stuck with me as uh, part of my American experience. You know? So to be an American, to be a Chinese American does hold for me a feeling of homelessness, uh, of, of uprootedness, uh, and uh, and then it's uh, reiterated by questions toward me of like, oh, where are you from, you know, and and that would be fine, but I don't feel like they answer the question where are you from when I ask them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, uh, the you know the assumption is that I have a foreign story, uh, but they've always been around here, you know. So how did this shape your career in ministry? How does it, how does it inform ministry today? Uh, so um, all aspirants to ordained ministry in the Episcopal Church meet with the Commission on Ministry before they pass you along to postulancy and the formal track of ordination. And during this interview, uh, one white man asked me, well, you know, we don't have any Chinese churches. Uh, where would we put you? And I was uh, really surprised and then hurt by this. Uh, at that time, I really loved the Episcopal Church because not that I don't love it now, but I had a much more innocent love for the Episcopal Church. And I had adopted this church out of uh, leaving an evangelical uh, a way of worshiping. And uh, I was, I, I, it seemed to me that it was a one-sided love when I uh, got this question from the man. And I think ever since then I have wondered uh, could I truly be loved in this church? So, uh, so I said uh, to him, because by then I had gotten mad, uh, so I said, so you can be my priest, but I can't be yours because I'm Chinese and you're white. 
and then uh, I said, well, my priest, who was a white woman at the time, is plenty priest for me. So uh, it was a, a painful introduction to what uh, ordained ministry could look like. <laughs> and, uh, and I think for that reason, it actually did affect the way I do ordained ministry in a couple of ways. One is uh, I don't want to be pigeonholed into what they call ethnic ministry, right? So I have uh, resisted taking on uh, ethnic ministry. Uh, I have uh, been in mostly white churches. Uh, actually, all the churches I've been in are generally white churches. I'm a rector of a mostly white church. And uh, I think that's, there's part of that in there for me. Is I'm good enough. I'm good enough to be here, uh, to be your leader. Uh, I'm not sure if that's always the healthiest thing, but <laughs> I think it did affect me. Right? You know, uh, it did affect me in that way. It, it it intersects with all kinds of things within race, right? Um, passing and not passing as white as Asian, you know. So, uh, you know, so I get stuff from um, you know parishioners who. Uh, would say things, you know, this, these kind of microaggressive events where, you know, they're like, wow, but you're so smart and articulate, you know, and those kinds of things. And, but what's been really lovely in the last year uh, has been uh, bringing my experience and education to bear on the race problem of the United States uh, okay. to to be one who uh, stands as a leader, who calls people to uh, account for their position in the, in, in the race system, and then to also hear Jesus call to walk the way of the cross uh, and uh, do some self-reflection on uh, each person's uh, uh, purchase within the race system and, and then move toward uh, dismantling that privilege that we have. You know? So, so you know, um, as uh, so often I remember, you know, uh, what, um, what Joseph said to his brothers, you know, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. What ways are you finding the church to be a source of strength or a source of impediment as racism is, is a national topic? I think in my parish work, even among so-called liberals and very um, people who wouldn't be a part of um, the, the climate, there's... Um, the work to be done there is the examination uh, of, of white privilege. And, and even among that group, sometimes it's hard, right? Um, it's hard to look at without um, being defeated by how it works or um, being in denial about how it works. So, um, so I, what I'm trying to reach for is uh, how to reach deep into our, our uh, Christianity beyond the time when it was wedded to uh, white supremacy toward uh, Jesus and his teachings and what he did for us on the cross. That for me has been the place where I like to sit. I like, I, I sit with Jesus at the cross knowing that that is actually the place that leads to life. And it's out of that place that I do almost all the thinking and 
and work around what's currently happening today. I think we all have a certain vision of the world we want. Uh, and uh, we have, I feel like for me, you know, I can have a lot of ideas about how I want the world to turn out. And they could be very good things, right? But um, this is, I feel like the best thing that faith has given me is that to follow Jesus means to relinquish what I think the world should be. To um, enter into a world that might be a lot more painful. Um, but um, it is the way that leads to life. And it's honest. That, that's, that is why I stay. Mm. It's, why, it's why I stay. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as uh, when uh, Jesus says to Peter, are you, are you going to go away? And Peter says, where will I go? You have the words that lead to life. Mm 